One of the great joys I've had the pleasure of in having in my life is uh, sailing. I have taken a lot of pleasure in that. It's a skill. You have to enjoy uh, doing something with your hands and, and spend time with family. And there is something about being on the water that leads to some very tasty meals. All that fresh seafood just works out really well. When on the water, if you're on a single masted boat, about 35 foot long is what we sail. 35 feet sounds like a big boat, right? It really isn't. It's more of like a starter boat. You really have to get up 40, 50, 60 foot before you're into the, the regular normal one. So we're in a little starter boat, I guess you'd call it. Uh, if you get the, the sails adjusted just right, you have a nice uh, stiff wind, you can get your boat going about uh, six, five, six knots. Right? And, and due to the joys of English units, I can tell you, you don't know this, but I'll tell you, one knot is 1.15 miles. So if you're going six knots, you're, you're blazing along at seven miles per hour. And, and when, you're, when you're doing it, it actually feels rather fast. Uh, try driving down the street at seven miles per hour, it won't feel like it, but when you're on the water it does feel like you're cruising along. And so when you're out on the water, hopefully doing your seven miles per hour, uh, there are other, always other boats on the water with you. It's very rare to look around and not see someone else out there with you. And so it is very important to know who has the right of way because it's very awkward to hit someone. Poor form. Right? So who has the right of way? Here's one of the most important rules for determining who has the right of way. Who has more power? Right? Who has the bigger engine? Right? If, if I'm a sailboat and I'm tooling along and there's a motorboat over there, if the motorboat needs to, to, to turn to avoid a problem, what's the motorboat do? Think. Done, right? They've turned. What's it take for a sailboat to move? Well, the, everyone's, Andy, go up to the mast. Yes, Dad. And then Dad throws the, the, the wheel over and you adjust the rigging and you come to your new tack and you readjust the rigging. It takes a little bit. If you can turn in, in like 5, 10, 15 minutes, you're doing well. Motorboat, dink, done. Right? And so whoever has the more power has, it has to, whoever has the more power has to give way to those who have less power. Right? That's how it works on, on the sea. The one who has more power has to make allowances for the one who has less. As we go through what Paul has to say today, this, this is theme is going to come up again and again. And I want you to keep, on, keep that, mon, that question in the back of your mind. When am I the motorboat? When am I the motorboat? When do I have the power? And when am I the sailboat? When, when do, who has the right of way in the situations in which I live? And so what Paul is talking about, uh, he's been talking about the importance of eating steak and how do you eat steak as a Christian. Uh, to just make sure we are, are on the same page from last week, there are those in the church at Corinth who can afford the extravagance of beef. It's an amazing extravagance. They can have it. They're, it, it, it and so they're bringing it to share it at their church meals because they can. And those who cannot afford a steak, those who cannot afford this extravagance, for cultural reasons that are more complex than I'm going to even attempt to re review, giving someone who doesn't eat steak any other time of year is like giving an alcoholic a six-pack of beer. All right, for, for reasons, if you, if you want to know why, go back to YouTube. The sermon's up from last week. But that, that's the situation they're in. If you give someone a steak who is not eating steak any other time of year, it's like giving an alcoholic a six-pack. It's going to lead to real problems. Right, this is the issue that Paul is addressing at the church. There are folks who are very used to getting their way in a very individualistic culture, a very me-first culture, and some folks who are in the part of the church are so used to getting their way all the time, they've started to think that they deserve it. Right? They, they should get their way, right? In chapter 8, Paul has said a few things about this, that you know, if he needs to forsake ever having a stake again, that's fine. But in chapter 9, he gets a little bit further into this, because... If he just talks about the issue of the stake, it's like he'd be, it's, it'd be the start of playing a game of whack-a-mole. You know that game in the arcades, you hit one mole and another one pops up. Right? You, you get the stake problem solved and they're just going to be another problem. They're going to fight about something else and, and then they're going to fight about something else. And, and so you have to address, uh, Paul knows he has to address the, the bigger issue here, which is how do you hold together as a church? When you get together as a people who follow Jesus, how do you understand how to make decisions? And so Paul takes the long way around to, to get he'll get to this. He kind of takes a long way around to get there. And so he starts out by talking about his paycheck. 
Specifically, he's never got one. Right? No one's ever paid him for what he's done in Corinth. He was there for years. No one ever paid him. And, and people who do what he does, which is sort of traveling philosophers, the idea of there being a preacher, there is no word for a preacher yet. There's just Paul. He shows up and he's doing this thing. He's teaching people. But the, the closest thing people can sort of compare him to would be like a traveling philosopher, a traveling teacher. And, and respectable, white collar, educated traveling philosophers were paid in one of two ways. Either you paid for your time. Wouldn't you like to sit down in the school of Andy? That'll be $20 per hour, right? You sort of charged a fee. No one's ever going to pay that for the school of Andy, are they? Uh, or you would go, uh, you would have a patron, right? You, you'd go, you'd find someone who was impressed with you and you would teach their kids and they'd probably feed you steak if they could afford to, to pay you. And these are probably richer folks. And so you'd have a benefactor or a patron who'd take care of you. Those are the two respectable ways to support yourself with what Paul was doing. Either charge fees or find a benef benefactor. And Paul was doing neither. Right? He was doing something very lowbrow. Right? Very uh, blue collar, dirty, just work a day, normal work. Right? What's he doing? He's making tents. He's, he's a seamstress. seamstress. What's a male seamstress? Is that? Taylor. Taylor? Taylor? Okay, he's a tailor. Uh, so he's, he's working with cloth. He, that's how he's, he's not taking a paycheck from the church. He's just making some tents. Right? And so he's being questioned about this. Paul, you aren't making a living the way we expect you to. You're not doing the, the respectable way of doing this. And then you're not eating meat. Paul, are you a scam? Are you legit? Should I be calling the IRS about you, right? Should I be calling the Better Business Bureau? Are you trying to pull a fast one on us? He's being questioned, right? You aren't meeting our expectations. You're not meeting our standards. What's, what's going on with you? So Paul responds and says, yes, I could insist on pay. Right? A soldier never works for free. A milkmaid doesn't ever go home thirsty. Right? Even an ox eats the whatever, it's the, the grain that it is threshing. Right? Other people in the church are being paid. Peter is being paid. The other disciples are being paid for their work in Jerusalem. And they're being paid, and it's enough to support them and their wives. Yes, the first pope was married, wasn't he? Uh, so they're being paid for their work. And so I, Paul, if I asked you for money, yeah, you would, you would pay me. Right? I could ask for your money. The fact that we're having this discussion, Paul points out, is proof of my status. Right? No matter what anyone else says, I, Paul, am talking to you, the church that I founded. You are the mark that I'm legit. Because you wouldn't be a church if I hadn't shown up. So yes, I'm legit. You, your existence proves that. And, and Paul could have, at this point, started doing a little bit of a tally and saying, okay, I was there for this many months, at this many dollars a month, travel expenses, per diem. And, and he could have made out a bill and handed it to him and said, you're right, you owe me this many thousand dollars. Thank you. Right? He could have done that, but, but he doesn't. Right? He doesn't do that. He's not going to go, go sort of upper class, white collar, start pulling a paycheck. He's not going to stop uh, making tents. He brings this up to point out that he is voluntarily passing on something that he has the right to. He has the right to be paid for his work. And he is passing on that right. He is declining to take advantage of, of it. It's not that he doesn't have it. When someone has a right and they choose not to exercise it, it doesn't mean the right goes away. It just means they are passing uh, on exercising that right. And Paul is doing it because it seems for, to him to be a way that his life can line up with his message. His message is of free grace. I am here to give you the good news of Jesus Christ for free. Free forgiveness, free grace, free salvation, free. Right? And so he wants to live a life that is a similar offering of free. It's something he talks about many times. Uh, he encourages, it's in the letter to the church at Philippi, he encourages them to take on the same way of living. Philippians 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete 
Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What, de- what, what rights does God have? It's a funny little question, isn't it? Right? What rights does God have? Whatever God wants, right? By de- very definition. God definitely had the right to not have to go die on a cross, but God did. God and Jesus Christ embraced humility, and offered freely his life. And Paul sees that and says, that's what I got to do too. I have to do that as well. He is passing on his rights because he wants to be like Jesus, who did not regard power as something to be exploited, but emptied himself and took taking the way of a servant. Paul seeks to do the same as he lays out for the church at Corinth what this means. Right? What does it mean to empty yourself, to take the form of a servant, to let go of your rights? What's that start to look like? Paul says, you know, what it looks like is to the Jews... You know, I'm going to act like a Jew to the Jews. So I'm going to eat kosher. I'm going to, I'm going to do all the ritual washings. I'm going to do everything a Jew needs to do. So that when I go to a Jewish person and I want to tell them about Jesus, they can hear what I have to say. And then when I talk to someone who's not Jewish, I'll eat pork sandwiches all day long and not care a whit about whether I'm washed so that when I tell them about Jesus, they can hear the free and good news about Jesus. And he has, has one more group to say, but I you got to remember that these letters are being read aloud to the church, right? And, and that Paul buries a zinger right here because, remember, Paul has sent this letter with Timothy, his protege. Remember, at the beginning of the letter, he said, if in doubt, do what I do. And if you're not sure what that looks like, look at Tim. Tim knows what I do. I'm sending Tim with the letter. Here, pay attention to Tim. And so Tim is at the front of the church reading this letter to them, and he's making these points that Paul is making, saying, you know, to the Jew, I became like the Jews. To, to the not, to those who are not Jewish, I became like them. And to those who had a hang-up about steak, I became like them. And can you just feel how Timothy would be making eye contact with those folks who were being a little bit too precious about their rights? And, you know, if I can buy it, I should have the right to eat it. You folks? Or maybe he avoided eye contact altogether, right? But that moment in which Timothy reads to the church, you know, Paul didn't get all uptight about what his rights were. Why are you? Right? That's got to have been a nice little moment. I'm glad. I I can just see Paul handing the letter to Timothy and Timothy reading it and going, you want me to say what? (laughs) But he does. He shows up and this is what he says. Right? He, He addresses them and he points out, Paul, for the sake of the gospel, will become weak. Weak was the term used for those who aren't able to eat steak because of their, their hang-ups. We talked about the details of that last week. This is, this is a broadside. I mean, he's just calling them out. The folk who are so worried about their rights, about getting to eat what they want to at church, these are the same folk who are bothered that Paul is not being respectable, right? not taking an income, and instead he, they're, they're all worried that one of their leaders is demeaning himself through this low-class labor of being a tailor. Paul is flat out saying that I'm not all that worried about what you're worried about and respectable. So what? What I'm paying attention to is those who are needy, who need the most. I'm paying attention to the sailboats. Y'all motorboats who are used to getting your way, y'all with the power, stop being so precious about your rights. Stop being so worried about what you deserve and start thinking a lot more about your responsibilities to others. That's kind of a hard-hitting little line to say to folks. Right? Paul wraps up the chapter by pointing out that, yes, indeed, this is a little bit of a challenge. It takes discipline. It takes the discipline that an athlete puts into it. Not punching wildly at the air, but being focused. It takes time. If you're used to getting your way and there's a better way, it's going to take some practice to, get, to figure out how to do it differently. Right? Remembering from the introduction of the letter, that uh, Paul tells him it's time to grow up and that takes some effort and this is what it means. Be like me. Stop worrying so much about your rights and start looking at your responsibilities. 
So how does this speak to us today, right? Paul does have something to say about how the church supports pastors. As someone who is supported by the church, thank you. Uh, this does is put kind of a broadside against my across my bow too. I mean, it, it makes me wonder. I mean, how do I do do this? I, I'm convinced that by the end of my ministry, uh, bivocational pastors will probably be the norm. People doing something and being a pastor, and so uh, makes me think about my future. But also, I think it has a lot to say about us, about how we uh, work as a church. How do we work together? Now, he is talking to the people who are used to getting their way. If you feel like you're always getting trampled upon and, and you're never getting your way, he's, Paul's not talking to you. But what Paul is speaking to are the folks who are used to getting their way. The folks who have power. And we all have power. We all have power in some situation. right? If, you're, if you are on your property and someone gets on your property, what can you tell them? Leave. Well, I'm going to charge you with trespassing, right? You all have power depending upon where you are. If you're at home, you have power, right? If you were at work or if you were at school or if you were with your family, it depends where you are and it depends with who you are with, right? But you will have differing amounts of power depending upon your context, right? And so there are places situations where we're used to being the motorboat. There are times when we are used to getting our way. There are times where we, we are places where, where we are so used to getting our way, we tend to think we deserve it. Maybe we do. Maybe we don't. But Paul would have us to look at that. Look in the mirror and po contemplate, ponder. If I'm consistently getting my way, and I always expect to get my way, might I be missing the needs of someone else? Right? If I'm the motorboat, am I, am I paying attention to the sailboats, the ones with less power? With great power comes more responsibility. You might have heard someone say that. Right? Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. We need to be aware of the danger of our rights, that our rights and our power can sometimes cause real problems, whether we see it or not. And it's often when we don't see it, we need people to help us see. We might, it, it may not be good for us to get our way all the time. And, and I confess, I struggle with this as much as any. I am particularly attached to the status quo. I like how things are, right? If I say something, it's because I think it's right. I wouldn't say it if I didn't think it was right. That's how we work, right? I, I like the way that I live and then I got married right and then things have to change and I used to work a certain way and then I realized I was live I've told you before I, I realized that Olivia was walking back to back law and orders we used to put back to back to back and they just roll them right into the other and, and I realized that Olivia deserves better than that right there are, I could insist on my right to do what I want and work how I want but Olivia deserves better and that, we got that down right they got that got better at that and then we had kids Whew. Right? And then it starts all over again. I have the same, same type of reels. You think you'd learn after a while. You, you think, you know, this is how I'm used to living. This is how we're used to doing things. And you know what? My kids deserve better than the status quo for me. They deserve better. It's not about my rights. It's about my responsibilities to my children. Paul is asking us, to remember that we have a responsibility to love other people like we love our children. Isn't that a, quite, quite an ask, isn't it? Quite an ask. Get over your rights and look at your responsibilities to love other people as much as and in the way that you love your children. We do this because that's what it means to be a church family. And when we do this, it is not just a way to respect others. It's a way to learn to trust. Because here's the other aspect of always assuming I'm right, because I always assume I'm right, right? Or else I wouldn't say it. If I'm sitting down with y'all and we're talking about something, not only do I need to make sure I'm not the motorboat, always assuming I'm right, but I need to learn to trust that when you say your piece, that God's going to be in the mix. And if I don't get my way, that doesn't mean God's will wasn't done. That means that I'm trusting God that when we gather together, that where two or three are gathered, Jesus is there, the Spirit moves, and God's will is going to be done. This is a way not just to learn to love each other, this is a, lear a way to learn to trust that when we're here together in the name of Christ, God is too. Sometimes through us, and sometimes in spite of us. And that's okay.